Our title today, How to Have an Effective Prayer Life. Our passage is Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, which says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You know, network news seems designed to cause fear, worry, panic, apprehension, discouragement, all the ingredients that when combined result in depression, in the one listening to all that news. Paul survived the stresses of his day by being wholly devoted to the Lord. And he wants all of us to know his secret. You see, Paul knew that prayer is the most effective way to prepare yourself for the battle of winning the world to faith in Christ. And that was the task that the Lord Jesus gave to him, and he gives it to us as well. He wrote in the companion epistle of Ephesians that we should put on spiritual armor that will ensure victory in reclaiming this cosmos for Christ. Here in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, we're told to focus ourselves on prayer and then in the next verses, to go out and witness in the power of the Lord whom we serve. Today, we're just going to look at the ingredients that will yield a successful prayer life, and really just one verse, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. If you want to be effective in your prayer life, Paul says in this passage that you must be earnest, vigilant, and thankful. Let's pray. Father, we humbly come into your presence today through the power of the Holy Spirit to ask for guidance in how to make our prayers effective. Oh Lord, let us never be ritualistic or perfunctory in our prayers, but rather always remember that when we pray, we're entering into the very throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May we earnestly seek your face, O God. Direct us now in our time of study as we discover the great and marvelous things which you have in your precious and holy word. It's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Our first thought is related to that word earnest, and it is earnestness in your prayers ignites the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 14 says that the early disciples before Pentecost were all in one accord and continuously devoting themselves to prayer. There was unity in one accord. They agreed on everything. The purpose was clear. The power was there because they had unity. You know, in 1906, in Pyongyang, Korea, there was a prayer meeting that was going on. I believe it was December. And there were the Korean pastors as well as missionaries present. But there was an underlying hatred that existed between the nationals, the Koreans, and the missionaries. They felt uh, very bad toward each other, felt that uh, the Korean pastors felt they were not treated as equals. And so this one Korean pastor finally starts by just confessing his hatred for specific missionaries. Then some of the missionaries started also confessing their 
hatred for some of the national pastors. And after a short while, the Holy Spirit's presence was so powerful that it began a revival that I kid you not is literally still going on today, more than a hundred years later. Korea became one of the most uh, devoted countries to Christianity on the face of this planet. And it began right there with a prayer meeting where unity was discovered through confession of sins. After the day of Pentecost, we read this of the early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's Acts 2.42. Later, rather than getting distracted, by waiting on tables, this is in Acts 6, the apostles declared in chapter 6, verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that, of course, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, is when they uh, developed the thought of deacons, ones who literally would wait on tables. In Romans 12, verse 12, Paul said that we should be rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 6.18, Paul adds, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I think you get the picture that Paul sees prayer as the secret for success in not only spreading the gospel, but also in Christian living. Colossians 1.9, the passage that we are uh, finding our own verses in chapter 4, Paul demonstrates his own earnestness in prayer with these words. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 of Colossians, he says that he's in pain in his earnestness of prayer, literal, physical pain. He says, for I want you to know how great a conflict I have on your behalf. And this was a conflict within himself, just praying so fervently, so earnestly for the Colossians. And then, a few verses beyond chapter 4, verse 2, he says this, Epaphras was always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We know from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, that we should pray without ceasing. And I think we can see this all throughout this uh, book of Colossians and all the other writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, pray without ceasing doesn't mean that you are praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What it means is that you're coming back to prayer again and again. It's not just a one prayer a day. It's a spirit of prayer that continues throughout the day and, and will again and again be manifest in actual prayer. The fact the Greek word uh, is the same one that would be used in Greek for a nagging cough. It just keeps coming back. But of course, this is a positive appeal. Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 6 of Daniel, showed the power of being devoted to prayer. His enemies in Persia uh, knew that Daniel had a tremendous prayer life. So they had the king make a decree that prayer could only be offered to the king on penalty of death. Well, Daniel knew the decree had been signed. He still goes to his room. His windows were open. He didn't close the window. He just prayed as he always did three times a day toward Jerusalem. And I'm sure that Daniel thought, you know, 
I eat three times a day, I pray three times a day, and now I have to make a choice. Do I continue my physical life or do I continue my spiritual life, my prayer life with God? And he had no hesitancy that the spiritual was far more important. And God responded by shutting the mouths of the lions when Daniel was thrown into the den. You see, God rewarded him not only because of his continuance in prayer, but he allowed him to continue his ministry there. His physical life was allowed to continue because God could see that he was devoted and in earnest regarding prayer. Jesus taught the benefit of earnest prayer in the parable found in Luke 11, chapter 5, or chapter 11, verse 5 through 8. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus is teaching us there that we should not give up on prayer. We don't get an answer right away. We just move on and say, well, I prayed. That was it. No, God delights in our asking repeatedly the same request because it shows our earnest heart desire. And of course, whenever I think of that, I fall back on the great uh, 19th century prayer warrior, George Mueller, the one that had that large orphanage. He reminds us, and we see the quote there, that we have on the screen that we should always go to God in prayer. Don't make any decision without going to God in prayer. It's so vital. He also said this at another point, I believe God has heard my prayers. He will make it manifest in his own good time that he heard, has heard me. I have recorded my petitions that when God has answered them, his name will be glorified. There's the key. Our prayers should always be directed to the glory of God. Whatever we're praying for, that helps us avoid selfish prayers that will not probably even go beyond the ceiling of where we are praying. God's name needs to be glorified. He began to pray, George Mueller did, for the salvation of five individuals. I read this. In November 1844, after 18 months, the first man was converted. Five more years, the second man got saved. Six more years, the third man was also saved. And at the time Mueller mentioned this in a sermon, he'd been praying daily for the salvation of the other two men for 36 years. Just before Mueller died in 1897, now 53 years after he'd started praying for these five individuals, one of the two last men uh, was saved. The fifth man was saved a few years after Mueller's death. All five came to Christ. That's earnest prayer. We have a second word, though, in chapter 2, which is very, uh, verse 2 of chapter 4, which is very important, and that is that vigilance in prayer fortifies our defense. We should be vigilant. Again, our text says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Those words, be vigilant, make me think of a defense. Sort of like one who's on guard duty. You're protecting. And if you're vigilant, you will keep alert. You will stay watchful. You have 
people whose lives depend on your watchfulness, on your vigilance. And Paul links that with the concept of prayer. We should be vigilant in our prayers. You know, we have an adversary who wants to destroy our devotion to prayer. I just talked to a man just a few minutes ago who comes to church, says, I don't think I'll be coming for a while because he's very disappointed that someone very close to him is on a ventilator. And uh, I guess he blames God. And I said, you know, the voices that you're hearing that say, don't go to church, it's not the Lord saying that. It's the devil. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Jesus warned his disciples to keep watching and praying that they might not enter into temptation, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We see those words in Matthew 26, verse 41. They did not heed, the disciples did not heed Jesus' warning. What happened? Well, Judas came with the priests all, and they arrested Jesus. The disciples fled. And then they were bound by shame and guilt that they didn't stay with the Lord. Very important to remember, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary walks about like a roaring lion. Unity I mentioned earlier. In uh, 1529, the Protestants and the Catholics in, in Vienna were fighting away. Finally, someone uh, noted that uh, Suleiman from the uh, Turkish Empire, which now was later called the Ottoman Empire, that he'd been sweeping up, took over all the Balkan areas, and he was actually at the gates of Vienna. And they said, I think we should do something. Well, thankfully, they united, and there was a group, actually a very small group, that was able to defeat Suleiman. Suleiman had said, uh, tomorrow, uh, just before this great battle, tomorrow I will be having my breakfast in a church in Vienna. Well, it didn't happen that way. The Lord brought a victory with a small band of uh, Christians, and the victory was theirs. Suleiman was defeated. They sent him a note saying, your breakfast is cold. But then what I'm most interested in is what they did that next Sunday in their churches. One man wrote a hymn based on Psalm 127, verse 1. Listen to these words. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. You see, when they chose that verse, for this hymn of praise to the Lord for the victory, they're recognizing that the watchmen, those who should be standing vigilant, will have no success unless they are being blessed by the Lord. And so vigilance is important in prayer. But you have to be with the Lord. You have to have your heart right before you pray. And so that verse reminds us that it's always the Lord that wins our battles. We are his instruments and we will have power only as it is given to us by the Lord. Earnestness in prayer, vigilance in prayer is how that will become reality and we will have the victory. There's a third thought in Colossians chapter four. And that also verse, same verse too. Thankfulness in prayer provides the anchor. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You know, I believe that this is the most vital ingredient to effective prayer. 
we need to be thankful throughout our requests. Remind God of his great accomplishments that we are so thankful for in the past, in our past, in past history, and ask him to do it one more time. God loves prayers that remind him of his great power and what he has done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We pray in faith always realizing that in our circumstances, even if they're not in our favor, God can work as he has worked in the past. In Second Chronicles 20, a passage that we've referred to several times, Jehoshaphat reminded the Lord of all his great deliverances of Judah. And the Lord responded by saying, you're just going to sit back? I'm going to fight for you. The battle will be won, but I will fight the battle. All you're to do is to praise the Lord. And that's really what Thanksgiving is. We're praising the Lord when we thank him for his goodness in our past lives and thank him ahead of time for what he will do in the current crisis. You know, everyone listening to me and watching today has a burden, and that burden should be viewed as a test from the Lord. It might be a financial burden, a bill that's unexpected, or maybe even an eviction notice. It might be a health burden, a continual nagging cough that was diagnosed perhaps with cancer. And now decisions have to be made. Maybe your burden is a misdirected teenager that's spinning out of control. And you can't sleep at night. You just cry out in anguish. Maybe your burden is pandemic panic. Many people are suffering from that. Difficulty to sleep. Wondering if you can ever be at peace at your job. You're being exposed and to the disease and you're in quarantine over and over again. The schools in Glendale, all four high schools, have students out today on quarantine. Hundreds of students are on quarantine. It is a fearful time. There's panic. You know, I was told once many years ago in Bible class, uh, when I was in college, Dr. Marchin A. King, uh, I was born in 1903, he would tell us about the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1920. It hit hard the San Fernando Valley. He was a scrawny 15 year old. In 1918, he watched the, as his fellow students, the big football players, would die from the flu. He decided nice summer sun to uh, lay outside and open up his shirt so the sun could bake the flu out of his lungs. He had no layer of muscle or fat over his, uh, his uh, chest and it worked well and he survived and was still alive 50, 60 years later. Uh, we ask Whatever load we have, we need to open our hearts to the Lord. And we open those in prayer. We don't go get plastered at a bar. We don't go on a shopping spree to divert our minds. We don't go to MacArthur Park in Los Angeles and look for a shady character that will sell us the drugs that will help us forget everything and get us to the next day. No. None of those will have a lasting result, and none of those are honoring to the Lord. You drop to your knees and pray. That's the key. And you pray, not just, oh, poor me. You pray earnestly from a vigilant point of view with thankfulness for all that God has done. Whatever your burden today, 
Thank the Lord for that challenge that's come to you and remind the Lord that you rest in his unchanging grace and power. Let the Lord know that you are earnestly seeking him in prayer and that you will be vigilant. You'll be on your guard in prayer. And above all that, continually in the midst of the trial, express your thanks and your confidence that he will provide the right answer for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this one verse, a short verse, which is so packed with great truths that will see us through any crisis. Lord, help us to be earnest in our prayers, to be vigilant in our prayers, and to always be thankful, thankful even for the burden for which we are praying. Lord, we ask for deliverance. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We see so much today that brings sorrow to our hearts. It should drive us, Lord. We know it should drive us to prayer. May each one watching today, right now, get down on their knees and start praying earnestly, vigilantly, thankfully for the burdens of their heart. And it's in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you all. We hope you've enjoyed our weekly broadcast. Consider writing to us or making a donation through Zelle with the email below. If you are in the Los Angeles area, join us each Sunday for services at 11 a.m. or 6 p.m. Bethany Bible Church Channel is a ministry of Bethany Bible Church in Glendale, California.